English when we talk about getting the mind to stay focused on something. We talk about it settling down. And in one way that's right. The mind tends to be flying around all over the place. And so the mind can focus on one object. It's like a flock of birds who finally settle down on one spot. They're all gathered together. And in Thai they have another idiom. They talk about lifting the mind up above its ordinary preoccupations. And so you can think of the mind either going up or down, whichever way it seems to speak to how it feels as the mind settles in with a breath. You drop all your other concerns. For the time being, you don't want to be interested in anything else, just interested in the breath. Take a cup of good, long, deep in and out breaths and see how it feels. If it feels good, keep it up. The question may arise, well, where does it feel good? It may feel good in the rib cage, but it doesn't feel so good in the shoulders. As you breathe in, there may be a tightness in the head. We'll see if you can find a way of breathing that feels good all over. Relax all the muscles in the head, in the shoulders, down through the torso, and try to keep them relaxed all the way through the in-breath and all the way through the out. You're studying the process of breathing here. And you realize that if the breath feels good in the body, it's going to be good for the different organs of the body. Because after all, the breath is the energy that keeps everything going. Without it, the body would die. The organs would stop functioning. So it's one kind of food for the body. And as with any other kind of food, you can fix it well or you can fix it poorly. You can feed the body well or you can feed it poison. So let's feed it good food, breathing that feels good, an energy that flows all throughout the body. If you take an interest in the breath, it helps you put aside your interests in other things. This is where it's important to think of this lifting the mind up, because most of our other interests pull us down. We have our passions for sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, and we think these are the things that give spice and interest to life. But they also tie us down. They get us intoxicated. So we don't think <clears throat> so we don't see things clearly. So we need something better, a pleasure that instead of pulling us down, lifts us up, gives us some freedom, gives us some clarity of mind. And even though there may be some desire in doing the practice, and there may be some clinging to the comfortable sensations that come, that's a healthy desire. It's even a healthy clinging. There will come a point in the practice where you let it go, but you can't let it go too quickly, or you shouldn't let it go too quickly. Use it as you find it's helpful to keep you with the breath. And as for the distractions that come along, you have to remind yourself they can get you drunk. The Buddha talks about different kinds of intoxication. There's intoxication with youth, intoxication with health, intoxication with life. Those are the three big ones. And then there's intoxication with sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, all the things we crave. And of course, when you're intoxicated by these things, you end up doing crazy things, stupid things, unskillful things. And that's what ties us down. We like to think of our pleasures as not having any price, but they do carry a big price. This is why the Buddha has us reflect every day. What do you have that's really yours? You can gain pleasures and they'll leave you. You're subject to aging, illness, and death, separation from all the things you love, and so is everybody else. 
The Buddha has you reflect on that. Sounds depressing, but then there's the fifth reflection. We're the owners of our actions. This is something we do have. These are things we do carry with us, the results of past actions and habits that shape the actions we keep doing in the present moment. Those are real possessions. So when you think about a particular pleasure, think about well, what are the actions that go along with it to gain the pleasure, to hold on to the pleasure? What do you do when you lose the pleasure? Because the pleasures don't last. And John Sawat used to like to ask, well, where are yesterday's sensual pleasures? Can you pull them up and savor them again? All you have is the memories. And we know about memories. They get distorted. And the memory of a past pleasure is not necessarily going to be a pleasant thing. So these things simply don't last. All you've got are your actions. The Buddha says you reflect on that and help you abandon any unskillful actions and develop skillful ones in their place. Then he has you go on to reflect that it's not just you, everybody, wherever you go. And wherever you could go, wherever you could be reborn, any level of the universe, everybody is still subject to aging, illness, and death, separation, and they all have their actions. This, he says, is enough to motivate you to want to get out. Because it's so easy under the influence of pleasure to do unskillful things. You work hard to do what's skillful, and then there are pleasant things that come about as a result. And then you fall for the pleasant things. You forget about the fact that it's your actions that are really the important aspect of your life, the things you really can take with you. So these are important things to think about as you're trying to get the mind into the present moment. Because if you realize you wander off, it's like getting drunk. John Lee talks about meditators as being like drunks. Kind of weave back and forth across the road, then fall over in a stupor. In other words, you don't really stay with your object of meditation. You're still thinking about the things you'd like to do, things you'd like to experience, things you'd like to see and hear and taste and touch, smell. It's got you weaving down the path already. And then you leave the meditation object entirely. That's like falling over in a stupor. John Fuang once said, you, know, you notice the pleasures that you really would like to experience, things that the mind tends to feed on. He says the fact that you are so obsessed with them is a sign that you had them in the past, and you miss them now. Just think about that for a few seconds. It's enough to make you want to get out of the whole process. Because after all, if you had them once in the past, you probably had them before that, and you had them before that, and you kept missing them after you lost them. And you get them again, and you lose them again. It doesn't accomplish anything at all. Whereas the path here, that, that you can lift your mind up to a higher level, the pleasure that comes from just being with the breath, the Buddha said, is a higher level of pleasure. It's also a level of pleasure that clarifies the mind. It's when the mind is steadily in the present moment, that's when discernment can arise. So the pleasure of the breath as you work with it. It's not just an inducement to help you stay with the breath. It's an important part of the path. It gives you something to feed on while you're following the path, so you don't go hungering after food that would be off the path. You don't get poisoned. It's interesting, the word, the word for intoxication and poison, Thai, can also mean that you're poisoned by something. And these pleasures that we go for in the course of the day, they're like poison. They have a really bad effect on the mind because they make you do unskillful things. So the Buddha gives you good food for the path here so you don't go off searching for poison off in the brush.
So try to take an interest in the breath. Notice how it feels in the different parts of the body. If you have any parts of the body that tend to be in pain, you might want to think of the breath energy soothing those parts, comforting those parts. The areas in the body where things seem to be blocked off, think of the blockage opening up. Sometimes you'll notice as you're focusing on the body, as you begin to make a survey of the different parts of the body, that certain parts seem to be missing. You may feel like you don't have a shoulder. If you opened your eyes and looked, of course it's right there, but feeling from the inside it seems that it's not there. In that case, try to locate where, where do you feel your hand, or again, from the inside. And how about the torso? Then work your way up from the hand and out from the torso and see where things connect. Give the breath new places to flow so that it's soothing both for the body and for the mind, healing both for the body and for the mind. And when you see that it's good both for your body and for your mind, then you're more likely to get interested in it, and you find that you're not so attracted to other things right now. You've got this new skill to master, this new area to explore. So don't let those old poisoned mushrooms get in the way. Learn to see your Distraction is just like that. This is poison. It's going to intoxicate you. It might kill you, kill your goodness. At the very least, it, it gets you all blurry-headed. You come out of the meditation not having profited at all. And not just with the meditation. As you go through life, you have to watch out for these things that pull you in, that are attractive, like poisonous mushrooms are the prettiest mushrooms around. But that doesn't mean they're good for you. So try to clear your head here with some good breathing and sober up as you learn how to use the breath to help the different organs of the body and help give the mind a good place to stay in the present moment where it can see things clearly. See its intentions clearly, see the results of its intentions. And that's the beginning of real discernment right there. We tend to think of Buddhist wisdom as dealing in very abstruse abstractions. But it really starts with this insight into what are you doing, what are the results? All the teachings on emptiness and on not-self, universal compassion, they all come down to this question. Well, what kind of action is this? Is it a good action? If not, what can we do to replace it with a better one? And how do you know if it's a good action? You look at the results. Some actions fill the mind with confusion, other actions empty the mind of its confusions. Some habits are worth holding on to, other habits are not. This is how the teaching on action gradually develops into teachings on emptiness, not self. And all the other more advanced teachings. But they start right here, and they never really leave this principle of what are you doing, what are the results? And how can you see that clearly? What states of mind can you develop? What states of mind do you have to let go of so that you can really understand all the implications of your actions? And the breath is where you start.